Wow. I think I already made a mistake. You're the University of Chicago graduate? Where fun goes to die, yeah. Uh, the best thing about Chicago is it's a, a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> um, so um, this conversation is going to take us away most of the time, I think, from the traditional stuff. But look, it's a political season. It's th these pe this would be like the Rolling Stones coming out and not doing satisfaction. So we, ha we have to start. But first of all, I have to start with a more personal question. Have you guys ever gotten into a genuinely hostile conversation on the air? No. Uh, I, don't, I can't recall no. one. No. I, I, I think it got tense sometimes during the Iraq War. It did. Uh, and that was tense on the air, and I, th I think we were still nice off the air. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it did. So, so no, no mark you ignorant slut kind of thing ever happened uh, on, the, on the news hour? Well, slut was not the word. Okay. <laughs> no, I should hope not. But is there, but, but is there an area, for, I mean, putting the incivility aside, where you find yourselves most in clear disagreement, because a lot of times it's much more a conversation than anything like a, a debate, but are there areas where it's pretty clear where the lines are drawn more than any other? Well, uh, uh, David The divinity it. of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that, that's right. I, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, the Iraq war was probably as close as we came to, to tension, um, and uh, I am quite reluctant uh, and resistant to uh, sending Americans into combat without a, a clear exit strategy, without an obvious end goal, uh, and without overwhelming numbers. And uh, so that, that was it, and it, it got heated, but that, I think that's probably the area that continues, probably David's more aggressive and more assertive in support of foreign policy. Yeah, I mean, well half of what we do is analysis. That's right. right. So that's... What's, what's actually happening? Yeah. And then the other half is what do we think should happen? Yeah. And is, we, we rarely disagree on analysis. We, we that's have right. disagreements over this and that, but on what's actually happening, we, we have some overlaps on things like national service, mm -hmm. uh, some yep. strong overlaps. Yep. Uh, I'm we're both in more, favor of it. Yes, yep. correct. Uh, I'm more, um, he never cuts me off. Uh, <laughs> I should say, you know, we usually, we de rarely do events. It's yeah. very rare that we actually go out it's together. Right. Yep. Oh, and right. they tend to be in Massachusetts at like, Boston College, or, and, and so, Mark, welcome to my people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, so let's, let us begin. <laughs> um, short of the black swan stuff, illness, injury, uh, unimaginable scandal, realistically, is there anything standing between Hillary Clinton and the Democratic nomination? Uh, yes. Um, there, uh, you have to understand about the Clintons. There is, uh, Obama is no drama. The Clintons are high drama. There will be, there will be moments uh, between now and the convention, uh, between now and the primaries, uh, that there will be a, a stop the presses story, whatever it is. Whether I have great confidence in Donna Shalala and running the Clinton Foundation, but I have absolutely no idea why Senator Clinton, Secretary Clinton, after she left the secretary's job, even went in the building at the, at the foundation. I mean, she was absolutely pristine, clear, virginal where that operation was concerned. Uh, all the fundraising and everything else. So I, I think there will be whether her, one of her brothers is involved in something. There will be something that, that happens that'll be a question, doubts, and I have no idea what the FBI is gonna do. But I mean, you have, if you're laying down the numbers, at Sahara and Vegas, you're going to say she's the prohibitive favorite, uh, overwhelming favorite. The, I don't see anybody beating her, but could something happen, uh, or something from her candidacy that could some way cripple it? Quite possibly. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. She, unlike Barack Obama, who surrounds himself with people who are not prone to scandal, she sometimes does surround herself with people who are prone to scandal. Very close people. Very, very close people, yeah. And, and so, uh, um, and, but not only him. Uh, uh, and so, you know, you, and, but the pattern is by now, I mean, it's been, you know, since she was the first lady of Arkansas, the pattern is always the same. There's a whiff of scandal, there's something happens, then there's the, an investigation, there's a lot of bad atmosphere, there's a hunkering in around her team, 
which makes everybody hostile. Then there are rumors that we're about to get some devastating revelation. The devastating revelation never comes. The Republicans overplay their hand, and she comes out looking better than ever. So that's the that's pattern. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's astonishing how her worst enemies are her strongest allies. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's yeah. beyond. Okay, um, history suggests that uncontested nominations can sometimes leave a candidate um, a little weak in the fall. It's like not having been on the field for six months, not having debate, not having, not having charges thrown at you. you know, the, there's a kind of a consensus in the party. And then you, you, you get a little weak. Do you think that that is a, a potential problem for her, assuming that she is the nominee? I, I think what you described, Jeff, is more likely to an incumbent candidate. Uh, once a person has been president of the United States, where people defer to you every day, where they hang on your every participle uh, and split your every infinitive and just care about you and tell you how wonderful and smart and thoughtful you are and how benighted and mean-spirited is any critic of you. And you see it in the first debate. I mean, the, Obama's first debate against Romney. I mean, when Romney actually you know, won, if it had been a fight, they would have stopped it. It was that one-sided. Uh, I, I don't think it hurt Richard Nixon in 72, I don't think it hurt Bill Clinton in 96 that they were uncontested. Uh, no, but I'm thinking election. of people like For, Gore in 2000. Who Gore, sort of Gore, in 2000 uh, Gore in 2000 was a flawed candidate. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say. I mean, when you get a, I, I, think, I think Hillary Clinton is a good candidate, and she was a far better candidate in adversity in 2008 than she was in prosperity. Uh, she, I mean, once she, she was in trouble in Ohio, or I saw her in Texas, Pennsylvania, she was a very formidable, good candidate. I, uh, I, 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 I understand your premise. I do think she's, uh, she's probably uh, better off with the other side going through what it's going, which is a real civil war in the leper colony. Well, we're going to get there uh, in yeah. a second. Uh, can I, can I yeah. ask a dangerous question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is sort of, of the audience, and I'm, uh, this may not work, but if you can see yourself, just consider voting for Bernie Sanders. Could you applaud? <laughs> so that, so Bernie Sanders I think against he's out Ted there. Cruz? What? Bernie Sanders against Ted Cruz? There, Mayor Bloomberg, here we come. OK. <laughs> I hear Mike Bloomberg getting up the machine already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the Fitzcruz versus But that was actually story. less than I expected. Yeah. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I'm, my view is she's tough. I mean, she's. Look at that Benghazi hearing. Mm -hmm. She just didn't wander in and do that. Right. No. So her staff beat her up for a couple days, Presumably. and she got ready for it. So I, I think that somehow they're beating her up, and she's, she'll be fine. The, the question that I keep, you know, let me roll this tape back. So it's 2007. Hillary is at this point sailing, and I'm supposed to do a piece on why she's impregnable. And I go see Mike Murphy, who is now with Bush, but then an in the, he was, he's not a, <laughs> tired anybody and I ask and he says I think she's incredibly vulnerable at a time when no one said well why do you think that he said because she can't be the candidate of the future she just it's just because of who she is he said she thinks that the woman the fact that she's a woman makes her the change candidate it certainly doesn't against didn't against Obama and looking to, looking to sort of fundamental beyond horse race this and that it seems to me that that is a potentially serious vulnerability for him in November, for her, I mean, in November. Well, it, would, it has to do with policy. Uh, well, it has to do with two things. Policy, is she, she has great many strengths. Imagination is not one of them. And imagination is a great political quality, to see and frame things the way no one else has seen and framed them before. And that's just not one of her strengths. And if she can make some daring policy moves that, and, and give us a new theme, then she can be the candidate of the future. Uh, but other than that, she'll, she'll, she could win as the candidate who seems basically competent and better than the other guys. Now, if Marco Rubio is running, he's, he could be incredibly weak because of his age. He could be incredibly strong because of his age. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's 68. Uh, what is he, 42? And a lot of voters, uh, maybe not in this audience, are closer to 42 <laughs> than 68. Uh, and, um, you know, I, and he actually does inhabit the 21st century natively. Uh, and he's, it's been interesting to me watch the Republicans because unlike most of the others, they're still, they, they were formed by Reagan. 
And so they, they talk like a Reagan Republican. It's tax cuts and let's say some bad things about government. He grew up in an era where there was a basic structural flaw in capitalism and you could have widespread growth and it wasn't translated down to the middle class. And so and he knows government has to do some special things to get money down to the middle class, wage subsidies, and he's got a big agenda for that. And so that actually is something dovetailed to the problems of the 21st century. And so he, I think he could present problems for her. Uh, two things. Movie, Ben Kingsley, Patricia Clarkson, uh, about driving, recent movie. Uh, he's a driving instructor. Learning to drive. Patricia Clarkson, in that movie, spoke in a way that if you closed your eyes, you would hear Hillary Clinton at the Benghazi hearing. It was, it was pitch perfect. David's right about her preparation. It was, at no point was it hectoring. At no point was there any sense of uh, I'm being picked on. Uh, it was measured. It was slow. She set the entire cadence of that hearing, so they looked totally out of joint. It was, it was a brilliant, brilliant uh, performance. And I say that in the best word, in the, in the best meaning of the word. Um, if Hillary Clinton were running unopposed, she would lose. OK? You mean an up or down? Yeah, up, or down up or down in November of 2016. Yeah. She will not be running unopposed. We're going to get to them. She is running against not the almighty, but an alternative. <laughs> and the other side, really, I mean, they are at this point, and it's a year to go, they have set the terms of the debate so badly for whoever their nominee is and forced more hoops for that nominee to jump through uh, and probably influence the choice of that nominee to the point where he is unelectable. Okay. And I, I would include Marco Rubio in that group, uh, less so than the, the which you're, You've actually spontaneously and yet brilliantly <laughs> led me to the, exactly where I want to turn on, as far as the Republicans go. Because this is the part that I'm frankly utterly gobsmacked. I cannot figure this out, which is this. Is it possible that the base of the Republican Party has so shifted from the conventional norms of how we pick a, a nominee, the party decides, you know, we, we find the most electable guy, that it is prepared to choose a candidate that would have been unthinkable even 10 years ago. And the reason I mention this is, is every so often, it seems to me, in political life, <laughs> voters get, get it into their head that they can do something that's never been done. And once they're told they can do this, like, for instance, recalling the governor of California and electing uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, they do it. Or in Minnesota, a very civic, literate state, you know what, we're going to put an ex-wrestler in as governor on a, a third party. Is it possible that the Republican Party is in a position where everything most of us have thought we understood about politics is at least temporarily inoperative? My mind cannot accept this. <laughs> 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 I have no evidence. The evidence <coughs> is that these two, I, we're talking about Carson and... and um, Trump is the name. Yeah. <laughs> is he your landlord or something? No. Uh, 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 so I just cannot imagine that a party will elect two people who are completely not in the same borough as the act of governance. Exactly. Uh, they can't talk about governance in the debates. When a policy matter comes up, they, they go silent. Exactly. They are completely implausible as governors, as presidents, as administrators. So mm -hmm. history teaches us that that does not happen. Uh, and, and so I'm sticking with history okay. <laughs> against all. And I still believe that there's a shopping phase and a buying phase. And we get to the buying phase, it'll be Ted Cruz who um, who may be loathsome to me, uh, and um, Marco Rubio. Okay. And, and, but I have no evidence to support no, that. I'm only raising this because, uh, you know, the Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, was very helpful to me in thinking about highly unlikely events, but that, that sometimes people think are impossible. And every once in a while, highly unlikely events happen. And the only thing that I'm raising this for is already Trump in particular, and I guess Carson, 
has exceeded what I thought the sell-by date was by several months. We had okay. four or five events when people would say, ah, that's it, he's doomed, they're out of here, and the next survey's come, not yet. But this is a party that's nominated Romney, McCain, I know, I Dole, know. I Bush. Get you. I mean, they're plausible, normal I, human beings. I, 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 un <laughs> I understand what the history teaches. I'm only, well, I'm, uh, a come in, Mark. A dissenting, a dissenting voice. Uh, the Republican Party has, in the past, uh, emphasize the credential of experience. Uh, David mentioned John McCain. John McCain was the nominee in 2008. He had been in the runner-up to George W. Bush in 2000. Mitt Romney was the nominee in 2012. He had been the runner-up the, for the nomination in 2008 to John McCain. Prior to uh, 2000, Bob Dole was the nominee who had actually run for vice president 20 years earlier, been Senate majority leader. He was preceded by George H.W. Bush, who had finished second to Ronald Reagan, who had finished president second to Gerald Ford. This has been the Republican pattern. There's been an emphasis on the credential of experience. I have kicked the tires. I know them. I'm comfortable with them. That has been totally repealed by this electorate. Uh -huh. so, but I, totally I, repealed in, the, in, in this sense. Not only is experience not an enhancing quality, it is a disqualifying factor. <laughs> I mean, you talk to Republican voters. You go to uh, uh, listen to a Peter Hart focus group of 12 Republican voters in, 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 in Indianapolis just done last week, and you'll hear them say, I, I don't want anybody with experience. That what I like about, and, and it, it, it's fascinating, that their absolute lack of any governmental experience is a positive for them. There is no unifying, this is why I think the Republicans are in big trouble. There is nothing that unites the Republicans in 2016, nothing. There is no idea, there's no vision, there is no unifying theme, and all there is is an, a, a fierce and irrational opposition to Barack Obama uh, that he's still somehow illegitimate. Uh, uh, I it, no, and, and it's, it, no, but it, I'm talking about Republican voters right now who are dominating this nominating process. And you, so you've got these two guys, I mean, Ben Carson, uh, who is a perfectly decent man if you don't happen to be gay or liberal or a Muslim, uh, <laughs> you know. And, and, and you've got Donald Trump, I mean, who, who just denies reality. I mean, they both basically look at what they've said and say, well, I didn't say it. I mean, Carson's for, Carson's for saying I'm a tithe, we want to put a tithe. I never said 10%. I'm, I'm talking about 15%, which everybody, of course, knows that's what tithing is, is 15%. So, I mean, it, it's, this, is a, this is a really bizarre so group. We've got, uh, it's a bizarre okay. electorate. We've got to, we've got to Go ahead. So, so I, first, on what they believe. So th this is basically a party of the white working class and the white suburban middle class. And so those people have seen their wages stagnate forever. Absolutely. And so they've, they're upset. Then they look at Washington, uh, and they see it is completely dysfunctional. Well, that happens to be true. And then they look at the social fabric around them, and it's not the social fabric of Collegiate and Dalton and places like this. This is the social fabric of the lower middle class, and it's in collapse. Marriage rates, trade association, social trust, it's in collapse. And so they're thinking, what's happening to our country? And they're apocalyptic about it. And so they're looking for something radical to change. Uh, and what's going to happen to that? Well, look at look what just happened in the house. You had the circus. The circus came to town. You had clowns coming out of the cars. You had monkeys running around the barrels. You had ladies on trapezes. And, and suddenly, out of the mayhem, Paul Ryan emerges. He's actually the most plausible and best candidate they possibly could have gotten. And so my completely fictional fantasy is that out of the circus, Lady Liberty will arise. <laughs> and you'll get a completely rational, good, normal president who could competently do the job. Now, I happen to think it's going to be Rubio. And I have no idea whether he's competent to do the job, by the way. I think he's a really great campaigner. I don't know if he can he actually is, do the job. He's a great campaigner. Uh, I think Bush is probably a better administrator. Uh, but nonetheless, at least he's a, at least if you ask him what the earned income tax credit is, he knows what it is. And so that's a start. Okay. <laughs> We're setting the bar. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, do you know what the EITC is? That's <laughs> um, 
and an interesting question you might pose to some of the people on the air as well, but that's another <laughs> story. See, the, the first part of what you said, to me, throws the second part in at least some doubt that I wouldn't have thought would be in doubt in any other time. That is, so far, everything about Trump and Carson that I thought was a bug is a feature. The very fact that, he's, that Trump is uncivil is what people like. That poll out of Iowa, the very fact that, that Carson says Obama cares the worst thing since slavery, 80%, yeah, that's why we like him. Now, I agree, you know, it's 90 days before the completely outrageously extortionate Iowa caucuses, and people are still trying on hats. It's just that they're trying on hats longer in a mood more throw the, everybody out than I've seen before. That's, that, that's why I raised that. But, but the, um, the example you gave of Ryan and this budget thing, um, do either of you real, see that as, as a portent that what we've seen over the past couple of years is now coming to an end, that there's going to be something like a normal functioning Congress? Uh, no. D David, <laughs> D David is optimistic about Paul Ryan, who's, who is smart who's thoughtful, who's serious, who's a decent human being. Uh, other uh, Democrats on, who've dealt with him when he's been in the majority will attest to that. Uh, personal acts of kindness and thoughtfulness and uh, avoidance of meanness. To, to become speaker, he made an agreement that guarantees his failure as speaker. He guaranteed that they would follow, follow what's called the regular order. The regular order means that committees will now produce legislation instead of the leadership as the way that Nancy Pelosi passed the Affordable Care Act. That is, the leadership works with the committees, but the leadership makes a decision. They have to come up with something that can pass the entire House that isn't going to be a disaster. Committees, by definition, are more specialized, more insulated. He's guaranteeing that the committee, the committee system in the House is guaranteeing they're going to have legislation come out which is A, not passable, uh, and B, probably to the detriment of the party in a general election. And C, he's promised that there'll be an open amendment on the floor. Now, for those of us old enough to remember, the Democrats took over in 1974 after Watergate, and they brought in reforms. And they went from 174 floor votes to 831 floor votes. So when you get 831 floor votes, what you get, you get what are called poison pill amendments. Jeb, Jeff's got a perfectly good bill on elementary and secondary education, and I just put in uh, any money appropriate under this act uh, will not go to uh, any, uh, any entity that has ever been on speaking terms with Hamas uh, in any way. They've been, at a, they've been at a conference where Hamas, anything. And that, that means that I have to vote against it. Or if I vote for it, I'm inviting myself into a primary charge and a primary challenge. That's what Paul Ryan did. He's to, to become speaker, and I, I think with the best intentions, he weakened the speakership in a way that I think dooms the speakership. Now, to that I want to tack on one thing, because it gives you two things to go at. When, when you step back and try to figure out how this clown car circus happened. Uh, you've got Ted Mann and Norman Ornstein, who between them have covered Washington since I think the Fillmore administration. <laughs> and they know it back, and, and they say in their book, I think it's called It's Worse Than You Think, mm -hmm. they put most of the responsibility on the, on the hard tack to the right of the congressional Republicans. Um, do you think they're right? I think they're three, well, two thirds right. But if you look at, there are people, there are political scientists who disagree with them, and if you look at the ideological drift of the Democratic Party, it's been pretty strong. Not quite as strong as the Republican Party, but it's been strong. It's, okay. So I'd say it's been both. And that reflects the country. I used to think polarization was an elite phenomenon, mostly in Washington because of the donors and the fundraisers. But in 1970, Americans were asked, would you mind if uh, your son or daughter married somebody of the opposing party? Yeah, right. And 5% said yes. That question was asked recently, and it was 40% who said yes. And so we've just divided. We've right. divided culturally, by lifestyle, geographically. We've mm -hmm. just divided. And so I think the country is more polarized and in both directions. I disagree with Mark about the structure of the Congress. First, in the last six years, we basically passed no legislation. 
So it's not like the current system was working so great. Second, uh, I, I believe in decentralizing power back to the committees because when I came to Washington in the Reagan administration, there were all sorts of policy entrepreneurs on the back benches and they had hopes of passing stuff. You know, there were even like Newt Gingrich or Daniel Patrick Moynihan or Bill Bradley had a weird currency bill he wanted to pass. They were, they were creating stuff and they were, so they were political entrepreneurs. Those people don't exist anymore because all the power is held by three people in the speaker's office. And I think that's the reason you get more, that contributes to polarization because the speakers are speakers generally because they're really good fundraisers and they're very partisan. But there's one other, if I may, there's one other thing to throw in for you guys to, um, to play with, which, which is that the people who've come to Washington, the Republicans who come to Washington in 2010 and 14, when I was covering their politics, I was struck by the fact that how they, as Karl Marx said, they disdained to conceal their aims. They said, we're not coming to okay. legislate. We're not coming to compromise because the whole system is corrupt and no matter what happens, the big government liberals, we are coming, as Buckley once said, you know, to, to throw ourselves athwart and say stop. Guys like, and that's to me what they've done. But in terms of making Congress work, that's a problem. Yeah, that's true. So Sarah Palin revolutionized our politics. You used to run for office to be, an, to be a legislator. And she ran for office because she wanted to be us. She wanted to just make statements. Uh, and so that's all they want to do, and they have no governing strategy. There was a guy, you know, when you go back to the craft of it, like what Teddy Kennedy could do, or what, um, obviously, Lyndon Johnson, we knew a guy, uh, Dick Darman. And he talked about the craft of passing a law. Mm -hmm. And it is not easy. I remember he talked about a guy named Mel Laird, who I think was Secretary of Defense under Nixon. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, there was a barber at the White House. And he would schedule an appointment. The guy had no hair. He would schedule an appointment at Wednesday, 3 p.m. with that barber. So in the Pentagon log, it would say, uh, Laird at the White House. Laird at the White House. Milton Pitts. That's yeah. Right. And so he was like, oh, with, he's with the president, so yeah. very important. Yeah. And, and then he, t he, I remember he told me this story, Darman told me, of passing a social security reform in 1983. And they finally got this brutal, politically brutal reform. And the last guy they could not get was this guy, Claude Pepper, who was like the spokesman for the seniors. So they marched him over to Blair House, across from the White House, and they just, everybody surrounded him, beat the crap out of him. Said, you gotta sign on, you gotta sign on. He finally, at two in the morning, they signed on. They marched him across the street and held a press conference at 3 a.m. because they knew if he had a chance to sleep on it, he'd back out of the deal. <laughs> and so like, that's the little stuff you do to get stuff passed. That skill level, I'm not even sure it exists anymore. Like, well, it, it, you know, it, I'm gonna make a partisan and I, and I hope a, a, a thoughtful observation at the same time. Partisan is, there, politics is the most imitative of all human art forms with the possible exception of political journalism. Uh, if it's worked once, if, if Jimmy Carter won with a blue bumper sticker, then we're going to wear blue bumper stickers. We're going to use them. Uh, and it, politics really is very, very much that way. Newt Gingrich led a revolution in 1994 by running against the Congress, running against Washington. Washington was a cesspool. It was a moral cesspool. If you were there, you were by definition. Uh, morally corrupted or at least compromised. And that was a winning formula. And if I run against government, and that's all, and they, but to be very blunt, the Democrats historically have been the government party and the Republicans have been the less government or the smaller government party. They became the anti-government party, Republicans did. And there's, there's no question, I mean, the 2010 crowd came, they, they ran saying, <clears throat> I hate politics, I hate Congress, I hate laws, send me to Washington. I mean, it is, it is, it's comparable to someone saying, I have a PhD in child psychology, I wanna be a babysitter, but I hate kids. Uh, and and that's, really, that's really what they had. David touched on something that, that does deserve more than just passing reference. The, the response of the Repu Democrats to the Republicans has been equally polarizing. The Democrats, are a party right now uh, that in most of its utterances has a contempt for the values of white working class people. Um, it's become a more upscale, more precious, uh, more social issue uh, party. 
um, and uh, at a time when the Republicans have given them a great opportunity. We have two growing minority parties, yes. shrinking minority parties. There, uh, once again, sir, we have not conspired on this, but, the, but this, this goes to the heart of something I wanted to start with you and, and fold you in. Because you're old school Democrat. Right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about the Democratic Party exists so the people at the lower end, the people who got the short end of the mm -hmm. deal get a better end. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that, that now, from what I have seen, at any Democratic event, the biggest round of applause will come invariably when the candidate says, I will protect a woman's right to choose. Now, whatever the abortion issue is, it strikes me that, th that if that's the heart of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. then almost by definition, the more traditional part gets a little lower, maybe not now with income inequality being so big. Do you think as, as a, you know, you were a Bobby Kennedy guy, you were an Ohio guy, this is, this is Rust Bucket, Rust Belt politics. Does the Democratic, is that part of the problem you see them having, that they have become more an identity politics party? Yes. And, and then, yeah, I don't think there's any question Democrats have become more of an identity politics. I mean, uh, they, I mean, you take, you take abortion. I mean, uh, America is ambivalent on abortion. America is pro-choice and anti-abortion. Now, you wouldn't believe that to see the direct mail. I mean, you'd think abortion was, you know, Dr. Spock finding a cure for polio. Uh, and and I, I don't think there's any question that the Democrats have become uh, far more conservative with social and, and almost uncomfortable in the, in the company. Now, part of that is that labor unions uh, systematically uh, have been dismantled. Uh, by factors of the economy, but, but by policy as well. Um, but the, there is less attention paid. I mean, the, the measure of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, but whether we provide enough for those who have too little, was the democratic creed. Uh, and uh, that, 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 no longer, that no longer is. Uh, the, the other side of this, we've heard ever certainly since the last presidential election, that on presidential years, the Democrats are in a, they, are, they have the coalition of the ascendant. Um, but I noticed that Ron Brownstein, who invented that term, is now raising the possibility that the Democrats could do so badly with white voters that even with the shrinking percentage of the electorate, they could be in trouble. Do you think that that's a, a sound analysis? Yeah, I've moved in that direction too. I, I used to think if you looked at every growing part of the electorate, they were all Democrats, and every shrinking part, they were all Republicans. So if the future electorate was 77-year-old white men in Mobile, Alabama, You're in the Republicans trouble. would be awesome. <laughs> but that's not what the electorate is. But it's been taking a long time for that emerging Democratic Party to emerge. And that's in part because of the graying of the electorate. And as the electorate gets older, it gets a little more conservative. So I don't know if it's politically correct to say it, but in some sense, the graying of the electorate mm -hmm. is countermanding the browning of the electorate. And second, the, the white vote is shifting so much. Uh, and so at least for this election, maybe not in four years or in eight years, at least in this election, I think the parties start an open. I would also, surf. just as a footnote, in 2012, as a percentage, the black turnout exceeded white turnout. Call me madcap, but that might have something to do with the fact that an African-American mm -hmm. was running for re-election. That's not gonna happen in 16. And I'm not sure that Hillary Clinton, she might be able to count on, a, on the, an overwhelming percentage of that vote, but the size of that vote I, I, two, uh, two, two quick points. Uh, George H.W. Bush in 1988 against, eight against Michael Dukakis got 59% of the white vote. He got 425 electoral votes. He carried 40 states. Mitt Romney got 59% of the white vote in 2008. He yeah. lost by 5 million votes. I mean, the country has changed. I mean, the, the Republicans, this is what I'm talking about, the Republicans playing to a smaller side of the field. They're talking to an electorate that is increasingly older, more white, and more culturally conservative, less tolerant, more intolerant. Whatever you say about the electorate of America, however it is splits ideologically, it is a far more tolerant uh, electorate than it was a generation ago. And in a politics, and I think you'd agree with this, Jeff, the higher the office, the more important the candidate. All right, nobody knows a lieutenant governor, let's be honest. I mean, nobody has ever run for lieutenant governor in his, his or her life, whose life ambition was to be lieutenant governor. You run for lieutenant governor because you want to be governor or you want to be senator, all right? 
president is different. We have a sense of who presidents are. We have a sense of how they got along with their siblings, what they, how they were in school, what they're like under pressure. And I'm telling you, given the Republican field as it's currently constituted, unless somebody's going to parachute in, they are nominating people who are incapable of getting over 45% of the vote against Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. Which leads me to remind David Brooks of his last appearance here with me. We had a brief conversation about Ted Cruz. You made some actual news by noting that he bore a strong physical similarity to the late and lamented Senator Joseph McCarthy yeah. from Wisconsin. That was a bad moment. Yeah. Um, okay. I putting, apologize. Putting, so but putting that moment yeah. aside. It's more like uh, Stalin. But no. I'm just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have been really impressed by him as a debater. So. I think that with all the furor about Rubio, he may have done himself more good at that last debate than Rubio did because he has this capacity, no matter what you ask him, to deliver 30 and 60 second messages. They're not dog whistles, they're foghorns, you know, right to the core of the Republican Party. Yeah. And uh, I take it that whatever you, you know, however, wh in whatever regard you hold Ted Cruz as a political animal, you take him very seriously. As a debating animal, yeah. I don't think take him seriously as a governing animal. He's, he's lost every governing process he's tried to get engaged in. Uh, if you talk to the people on the committee he sits in, he is completely ineffectual and not there and not interested. But his people don't seem to care. But, well, so politically, Mark made this point, I think it might have been off the air on Friday, that the answer he gave, he gave the first attack on all the CNBC folks. And it was not just an attack. He had stored in his head all of the, that's right. he caricatured each of the worst of their questions mm -hmm. and then and revealed repeated it all. And repeated it, that's right. And it was Without like a boom, boom, boom. Which yep. you can prep for. Right, so, the well, so the guy was Princeton debater, Harvard Law. I mean, the guy was, was a national champion, uh, not champion, I think he came in second in the country in debate. Pretty good. He lost to Austin Goolsbee, the former Obama economic advisor. Uh, and so he's got it. His problem is that he has turned himself into something his old friends don't recognize by trying to be a Texas populist. Uh, and, you know, I just don't think he's sincere. Uh, and Mark said it, it's um, a lot, the president, the candidate really matters. And I know a zillion Republicans, some of whom are quite conservative, and it's like, you know, when you're putting up a nominee or electing a president, you're inviting the guy in your living room for four years. Do I want Ted Cruz in my living room for four years? No, I mean, a lot of solid, very conservative Republicans just don't want that prospect. So I think at the end of the day, that dooms him, aside from the fact that it is a white working class party, but in the primary electorate, the, and there's been a break between non-college Republicans and college Republicans. And he would presumably get the, the non-college. Uh, and they're more college. And so that's why I think if it's Rubio Cruz, which I expect it to be, that Rubio has the advantage. Okay. Jeff, on the, on the polarization thing, I just want to tell you, David, uh, David's point about Cruz, it, in the 2000 George W. Bush campaign, the headquarters was in Austin. And uh, everybody who worked at that headquarters when Bush won, everybody, I mean, the people who did the Xeroxing and the people who picked up the papers and all, every one of them got offered a job in Washington, which I thought spoke highly of George W. Bush and the group he was. There was one person in the entire building who everybody agreed should not go to Washington and should not, and that was Ted Cruz. Okay, I mean, so th th there, is, there is a personal, there is a personal element. Having said that, his answer in that debate last Wednesday night was the best answer I have ever heard given in a political debate. He did, if you recall, he did the recitation and he framed it in a way as he's defending his colleagues exactly. and say, now, Ben Carson, you can't do math. Donald, Donald Trump, are you a comic book villain? Uh, Jeb Bush, you're going to get out of the race. What's wrong with your numbers? Marco Rubio, you're going to leave the Senate. Are you going to quit? I mean, and he just does this off the cuff with no notes. Now, the only one that was a better answer and it was the answer that Rubio gave to, because okay. he had, you know, and we know, uh, having been around politics for as long as we have, that answer was recited and rehearsed and fashioned at least 150 times before, and he did it like it was organic, like it grew out of the moment. 
The problem with polarization is this. It's not just a question of disdain for the other side. Political parties are coalitions. They should be. They should be coalitions. Ronald Reagan said something that was absolutely true. Haley Barber, who was governor of Mississippi and Republican national chairman, was the political director of Ronald Reagan's White House. And he used to quote Reagan uh, to Republicans when they were being upset about, my God, why are we supporting people like Javits? Or why are we supporting Clifford Case? Or why are we supporting Republican moderates and Bob Michael and this and that? And Reagan said, if somebody's with us 80% of the time, he's our 80% ally. He's not our 20%, he's not our 20% enemy. And I, I think in both parties, it's become, and that's how parties function. I mean, when we passed civil rights laws in this country that repealed America's original sin, more Republicans voted for them than Democrats. I mean, the, the opposition to it came from Democrats, but they were coalitions. And that's the only way you'll ever get anything but, done. But that, that now takes us, it seems to me, to beyond the 500 polls that will be out in the next 48 hours, which is this. You guys have both written in the past about some pretty fundamental stuff that's on the table, whether it's wage stagnation, uh, the shrinking of, of upward mobility, the American infrastructure, which when you go to any other country, you come back, it's the third world. So given the kind of politics, but these, these solutions are solved at some point through the political process, broadly speaking. I'm trying to figure out how whatever happens in November, there's any plausible path to policies to be enacted to deal with these kinds of issues. Well, you have to have a candidate who runs on an agenda. and it, mm -hmm. you can, You're not gonna be create end polarization just by being nice. It's just niceness no. is not enough. You have to have actual policies that can get you 60 votes in the Senate and a majority in the House. And I can, Mark and I could sit here and come up with a combination of policies. Yeah. Uh, and any think tankers could do it. Uh, and so, you know, I say, you know, the thing I care most about is, is social mobility and a human capital agenda. Well, I have some ideas that Republicans would like, a ch big child tax credits, uh, some ideas Democrats would like, expanded early childhood education, throw in some national service, throw in, you know, charter schools. You, you could just get it, you gotta be strong on both sides. Just pick some big Republican ideas, some big Democratic ideas, and say, can you guys live with this? But, the, and so I think you could do that. I think you could do a tax reform. I could think you could do it with a lot of really big issues. Could but, in what sense, David? Could in that you could imagine this political climate producing what you're talking about? Well, not the national climate. I think this is an issue where it has to come from the top. Say it's Hillary Clinton and Paul Ryan. They just have to sit there and say, uh, we are gonna do this and we're gonna force leadership, we're gonna force a change in political culture from the top, you and I are gonna to hang together, we will hang together, we will hang together, and I see the two wiser and older political experienced heads shaking. No. But that's the only way out of this, it is the only way. I'm asking. Elections have consequences. 1980, Ronald Reagan is gonna win, he's gonna beat Jimmy Carter. I mean, Jimmy Carter is dead man walking politically. And You're Reagan close. lays out I'm gonna cut the side scopes for the government, cut taxes by a third, double the defense budget, and balance the budget. Uh, two out of three ain't bad. But he, you know, he, he, he laid out, so when he does win, and he carries the 44 out of the 50 states, there's a sense of mandate to what he's done. That's what Hillary Clinton has to do if she's the Democratic nominee. She has to lay out the three things that she will do because it, if in fact it develops the way it looks I, I think it looks right now, and the Republicans nominate someone who's unelectable. I mean, literally unelectable. And she, she, Hillary cannot get over, whoever runs against Hillary gets 45%. I, I don't care who it is. Benito Mussolini would get 45% <laughs> against Hillary Clinton. And- I have to think about that. 44-7. 44-7. So, but- Mussolini sorry, Trump. But, but I, I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> Mussolini Trump. I get the, the, the expressions running on time. We the got the ice there. It's it's, but in other words, the, the biggest mistake she made in that debate was saying her enemies were Republicans. Yeah. Because you have a chance if they nominate Carson, or if they nominate Trump, or they nominate Ted Cruz, who's unelectable, you've got a chance of putting together something that haven't been done for a generation. Republicans for Clinton. I mean, you have putting together a group that's saying the country's more important 
than this narrow political, and of winning a mandate okay. that way. I just point out that, that uh, um, this is the, you know, the, the, the G, black swan, I don't know. My feeling is if somehow, one of the things that may even help Donald Trump, should he stay in this, is a lot of these primaries are open, and I think there are a lot of disaffected white working class Democrats who respond to Trump's message and may show up in places like New Hampshire and Michigan where they can. I mean, just, Could I? but um, the audience has sent up some questions and I'm going, there are a wide variety, but this, this is the most unavoidable question of the night other than what's the score, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is this. If Hillary is indeed the candidate, whom do you think she will choose to be her running mate? It's called a pregnant silence. Yeah, no, I, I, have, I, have no, I have no idea. I mean, a running mate choice is determined by events of the time. I mean, that to try and think of a year in advance uh, is, you know, it's just a, is an exercise okay. in folly. I mean, I, I mean, agree. But I mean, what, what will she need? Will she need, you know, it's hard to believe she'd need foreign policy credentials. Maybe it will, but will she need someone with military experience? You know, the three Democrats in the world that have military experience. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, what, what is she going to, you know, what, what is she going to need? She's not going to need anybody from the financial community. Uh, you know, is, it, is there a state? I, I don't, I mean, okay. yeah, I, I don't, I don't have any. No, idea. I think this is impressive that even in the, in the, you know, I live in the heartland of America now, Santa Barbara, California, and Manhattan. <laughs> You guys live in the snake pit of Washington, where I assume this is the only this is con this is foreplay <laughs> conversation, and you haven't come up with a name. I'm no. very impressed. Do you? A little have too any? much information there, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Amy like Klobuchar. Person, Amy way. Klobuchar. Amy, an all woman ticket. All woman ticket. Okay. Uh, and she's younger, and she's just normal. Okay. And well, that's a contrast, I guess. Okay. <laughs> All right, I, I mean, that's, it's kind of like a roller derby thing. Where the, 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 it's it's the, the Democratic right. bench is not that deep. Yeah. And so I'm running through a lot. You know, I thought Jerry Brown would be a good candidate. Yeah, if he, were, uh, he if would. If he had run, he'd, he'd be right for the year because he's experienced, but he's also a little crazy, and that's like perfect. Okay. Uh, and he's got a record. Uh, and he's got a record. He's got a story he's got to tell. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'll give you two names if I'm right. You're going to say, holy Christ, does he know what he's talking about, and then you'll forget it. Okay. Uh, Tim Kaine, Sherrod Brown. So I thought of Sherrod Brown. I think he's too Senator best. from Virginia, Senator from Ohio. Cain was a former uh, governor as well, I believe, yep. right? Yeah. Governor and mayor of Richmond. Sh Sherrod Brown would make, be making a big bet on the leftward shift of the country, which yeah. may be a good bet, but that would be a big bet. But he won Ohio big the last time he ran. He's yeah. very, and his wife was a Pulitzer Prize winning writer. Well, that should mean it's something. It's curricular. Okay. Um, and Tim Kaine's wife is the daughter of the Republican governor, Linwood Holton, who integrated the state of Virginia. Okay. Okay, Chelsea Clinton, that's my new. She's yep. going to be Chelsea Clinton nominated. Clinton and Clinton. Is she 35 yet? Uh, she's got to be close to 35, sure. Okay, close. Well, close uh, okay. Sid Blumenthal or Mark Penn. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Okay. I'm, we I, get more ridiculous that, as the I, night gets yeah, later. Yeah, I understand. It's only, it's only 820. But anyway, <laughs> um, Carl Icahn. Uh, what are Rubio's weaknesses and strengths? And I should mention that. In Politico magazine, Annie Bardak, who's a writer who knows more about the, uh, the Cuban-American life than maybe any 10 people, has the 10,000 word, really fascinating profile of Marco Rubio. But, but you, pre you obviously are high on him. What would your concerns be about him? Well, first, the, the highness, when you talk to him, he talks intelligently and earnestly and carefully about policy. So some people really don't care about policy and what you would do in government. Uh, he, he, um, he actually does care, he does know, he has depth of knowledge. That is not just because he has to give speech, but he actually cares about this stuff. The weakness is when you go down to Florida and talk to the Republican bigwigs in Florida, uh, they, um, you know, before all this campaign stuff, they liked Bush better just because they thought he was a really awesome administrator. Uh, and they had, they, for them, Rubio is a blank, sp uh, blank slate and they think he's a little young, not only young looking, but just young in that way. And so that's the obvious one. Uh, and I, I, I worry about that myself. Uh, you know, when you're president, you're just making a million decisions a moment. And every little character flaw turns into a big national problem. So Obama has very few character flaws with the possible exception of aloofness. 
But that aloofness has turned into a big problem when it comes to passing legislation. Well, I'll just tell you what David McCullough said years ago. I asked him, how do you, how do you, you look at these people, how do you, what traits, what do you look for in a president? What, what will tell you if he's, he or she is, he says, you don't know. That was basically his answer. You absolutely don't know. You it know? helps a lot, I think, to be, just have that, there's a great Isaiah Berlin essay on, on Tolstoy, but it's, 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 he says there's, at certain moments, somebody has an intuitive awareness of how events will flow. There's just an in-touchness with the times that people have. I think Clinton had it in 92. Oh. Uh, and that some, it's, it's ineffable, but there's, the times are flowing in a certain way, and you're with those times. And Rubio's in those times and from a Republican sense. Bush is in 1956. Uh, and so he's Je Jeb Bush is just out of touch with the flow of the time. He's, he's a good the, guy. The 20, uh, 2016 Republican Party, the, the question of being in time, uh, Bill Bradley, uh, who I always thought would be a great presidential candidate, waited until he ran against Al Gore in 2000, uh, who was the prohibitive favorite, uh, challenged him in a state, Iowa, had 3% unemployment, where Bill Clinton had a 75% approval rating. Um, and it, it, was, it just became an uphill, uh, close but uphill, uh, an impossible fight. But if he had run in 92, uh, I think he would have beaten Clinton. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I, in other words, it is, it's the man and the times. David McCullough uh, quoted, said of Harry Truman, Harry Truman liked being Harry Truman. He was comfortable being Harry Truman. He never thought of being anybody else but Harry Truman. Uh, and that, that's really a test that people have with, with any president. And I, I would say about Rubio, if I were running Rubio or interested in Rubio, he is, uh, his foreign policy is uh, neocon in a year where America is not neocon. I mean, he is, a, he is a very aggressive militarily. Is there any Republican other than Rand Paul who's not neocon? Uh, yeah. Oh, Trump certainly isn't. Good point. Uh, you know, and ben, yeah, David. ben Carson has not Cruz. taken a stand yet. Cruz, yeah. Uh, Cruz is not. Cruz is decidedly not. Okay. Uh, so uh, th there's four. I mean, if you want, I mean, oh. I know there's 17. Uh, but uh, <laughs> so I, I would say with, with, Rubio, with Rubio that uh, he is, uh, his, his strength is that, that he's, he's the most gifted natural politician in the race. Um, and... Uh, I, I think he's come lately to many of his positions. Uh, and I, I think that is always a, a problem with, with anybody. Is there any chance, okay, you, I should preface by saying you at one point did a column, you were for a McCain-Lieberman party, the most relentlessly centrist, I mean, that's centrism on steroids. Um, but this question keeps coming up. Is there any chance uh, Mike Bloomberg could run independently and win. If it's, um, <laughs> thank you alumni of the Bloomberg administration. Uh, no, uh, you know, if, if Sanders had somehow, I mean, he still, still might pull it off. I don't totally rule it okay. out. I don't think it's likely, but if it's Sanders Cruz, yeah. then the, the space is there. Yeah. But you know, Bloomberg you know, has not been private about this. He looked at it seriously a few years ago and at the, in ideal circumstances, he could see himself getting That's right. a third of the vote and some percentage of electoral votes, but then it goes into the House. Right. He a, said, only one person has ever said this sentence to me. Near, you know, he said, I could spend half a billion dollars. That's the only person who's ever said that to me. Right. <laughs> he said, and the best I could do was tie up the Electoral College. I think he sat down with a yeah. map and crayons and his friends who wanted to run and said, Give me 270 yeah. electoral votes, and they went, uh, yeah. these we're still there, you think? He also said, how many five foot six Jewish guys have ever divorced been divorced Jewish yeah. 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 My dreams were crushed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he threw in billionaires, so you may. Oh, have, well, have, my, the, uh, the second I, part of I, this, I, of this uh, you know, inevitable question is, could Romney be drafted for lack of a good candidate? Because it worked so well last time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Romney, Romney was bluffed out of this race by Jeb Bush's pack. I mean, Jeb Bush, if you recall, Romney looked at it quite seriously. He was leading in the polls, and he looked, looked at running last January, and Jeb Bush, sh shock and awe, 
$105 billion political action committee. Romney called several of his fundraisers who were unenthusiastic about it. Right now, Romney looks like a cross between Dwight Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan in this field. I mean, he really looks like a hell of a candidate. Um, and I, I'm sure he regrets not having gotten in. So we can dream. <laughs> Just don't like dream the, about Palmer. Just like the big bands are coming back. Don't, don't dream just, about Palmer. Just a brokered convention, right? Every not a, not a brokered somebody writes no. that. Who do you like on the third ballot? Yeah. 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 Well, talk about 1956. That's right. Given your wonderful civility, how do you view the so-called gotcha questions in relating to the quality of journalism? I take it this is pivoted off the last debate on the... Uh... I mean, I, I, I'll defend CNBC. Okay, I mean, they, they asked questions. Donald Trump's tax plan by the Tax Foundation, which is a pretty conservative group, I mean, it's not a, it's not a liberal think tank, said it would cost between 10.1 trillion and 11.9 trillion in a deficit for this country over 10 years. And just to ask that, and Ben Carson says, it's going to be 1.5 billion a year. Trillion a year is what it's going to raise. It's going, you're going to be short two trillion dollars a year, and so when asked about this, now did they ask about a comic book? I shouldn't have put the comic book in it, but it's almost like how dare you? How dare you ask us? We've come up with this plan. How? Why? How do you get the right to ask us that it doesn't somehow add up? And I, I really felt that was. Uh, you know, I thought those were legitimate, legitimate questions. Um, that, uh, that Carson and, and Trump were hit with. And, and I thought the Rubio question had been in the leading paper in the state that day. And I thought that was a legitimate question. It certainly, I, I don't think either Rubio or Trump is complaining, uh, uh, Cruz is complaining about any of the questions uh, in that Wednesday debate. Yeah. It's a tough thing to do, know what to do journalistically when you're brazenly lied to. So some of the Carson stuff with that uh, uh, dietary thing and like the, the the uh, Trump, uh, I didn't, I, I like Mark Zuckerman. I never said that about Zuckerman. Um, well, that was just like not true. Yeah. And, and if true, it was on Trump's webpage. I can't imagine he's ever read his webpage. But, um, but still, uh, it's tough to, like for a journalist in the heat of the moment, do you say, well, sir, you're actually lying? Or yeah. do you say that? That's yeah. a tough thing. For, it was for, interesting that the most, the toughest response to Ben Carson was on the question of his uh, lucrative arrangement with this supplement yeah. thing. Right. The National Review, not exactly a left-wing publication, flat out said, yeah. he's a liar. Yes. But I see your point. In a, in a debate, yeah. if you're the journalist yeah. and he says that, and you, <laughs> assuming you are smart enough to know that and say, excuse me, Dr. Carson, but... Yeah. You know, maybe you don't have to say a lot. I think just all the questioners from now will know, I got to have the documentation. I just got yeah. it right in front of me. And if they say yeah. no, I'll just say, well, it says right here. Um, this is a question specifically about a column you wrote, David, about Rubio, that his plan for welfare reform is to hand it over to the states. And this questioner says, imagine what happens in uh, Alabama and Mississippi where the legislators just don't believe in welfare. I mean, and the level of support yeah. is pretty much... Right. Well, well, first we, of all, the, the money is the same. The, the money comes as the same. And second, I do think welfare is one of those systems where how do you get a kid through high school? How do you get a, a young man into the labor force? Well, we don't know. How do you get marriages to happen at a higher rate? We don't know. And so I do think that is an area, and I'm a little uncomfortable if they start cutting the overall rates of spending, but in Rubio's plans, they wouldn't do that. They would be adjusted for inflation, adjusted for poverty rates. I think most states uh, are, and most state governors and most state legislators are genuinely interested in solving problems, certainly way more than Washington. And so he had a, one of the states he mentioned was a, a, a Utah, which has this apparently effective way to get single men into the labor force mm -hmm. through some training and through some job right. centers and things like that. And so let's try that. Uh, but it, there are a lot of things we just like, we have tried generation after generation to uh, increase marriage rates. We do not know how to do that. That's right. And so. Well, this uh, is a theme of a lot of your writing is that 
I, I, I've watched you kind of move away from the more traditional political writing into a much more uh, asking much harder questions about do we know how to translate public policy into better conduct, into better yeah, results. Well, I've migrated into conduct mostly because there used to be on this stage in the 1950s, you had Abraham Joshua Heschel, you had Martin Buber, you had Reinhold Niebuhr, you had secular sermonists. Mm -hmm. And they were, telling, they were answering questions which are foundational to a good life. How do you take suffering and turn it into um, something transcendent rather than something that diminishes you? Uh, are, what, kind of, what, what is love? What is friendship? What is gratitude? What is passion? And I found those books, and I continue to find those books, extremely useful in helping me lead a better life. And there are not nobody but fewer, fewer people on the public stage that are doing that kind of stuff. Uh, in our context, in this room, there's a guy named Mayor Soloveitchik across the park. I think jo Dr. Uh, Sachs, or Rabbi Sachs, is coming to the stage in a couple weeks. There's a couple. There's a guy named Tim Keller at Redeemer Church here. But they tend to be religious, within religious lanes. And so my basic view is the, our public discussion is over-politicized and under-moralized. And I'm basically going to spend the rest of my life trying to reintroduce some moral categories and moral discussion into the realm of the New York Times or NPR or PBS. And, and I must say I get great satisfaction. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me jump in. Let me jump in on Rubio and, and commend him for raising the issue. Why, why do I say raising the issue? Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. There are 359 billionaires in the United States. Six years later, there's 536 billionaires, 131 in California alone. But what's overlooked is when Barack Obama is elected president, there are 13,240,000 American children living in poverty. Now, what's living in poverty? It means a family of four with less than $24,468 a year. That's $67 a day to keep a family going. Now, after six years, and I, I do take issue with David, what have we done in six years? I think we've done a lot in six years, whether it's the Affordable Care Act or TARP or the bailout or saving General Motors or saving the economy. There were some important things done. But in those six years, we've gone from 13,241,000 children in poverty. And, and th these are kids who depend on elders for food, for guidance, for shelter, for clothing, for everything to 15,741,000, a two and a half million increase in children in poverty. Now, if we can't, in this country, debate what candidates are going to do about reducing, because it, it's a matter of dollars. It's a matter of getting food and shelter and, and just clothing and guidance to these kids. I mean, if we can't do that, I, I, I don't care what, what our Dow Jones is, I don't care how big our throw weight is, or how ready our military is, I mean, that, that is a, a moral failing. And the idea that it goes undebated and unaddressed, other than let's move it to the states, which I, at least it's, it's starting a debate. But I, I wait on the Democratic side. I mean, we're, we're still running on John Edwards's fumes. Uh, I mean, John Edwards, to his credit, ran in 2004 on Two Americas when nobody even wanted to talk about Two Americas. And Bernie's picked up the standard, and God bless him. But I mean, ch children in poverty, I mean, is a, is a, is a national, national challenge, disgrace, and, and failing on our part. And my God, if we go on addressed in this campaign, uh, we, we just, we just uh, should never look our children, our grandchildren in the eyes again. Um, actually, I think you've answered, both of you have answered the question uh, that I didn't ask, that what, what important questions are not being asked about the 2016 campaign. Mm -hmm. But uh, given where you've just, the inspirational quality of your last answers, um, and being the ex-National Lampoon writer that I am, one question is, if Hillary gets into the White House, what role for Bill Clinton? <laughs> and can he stay, the other part of the question is, and can he stay out of trouble? Ambassador to Mecca. <laughs> uh, um, 
Uh, I, 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 Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Bill Clinton in the White House all day with nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope we got an assignment for him. No, I mean, this is the, the best campaign speech of 2012 all by itself, hands down. Forget Obama, forget yeah. Paul Ryan or, or Barack, o, Barack Obama, or Mitt Romney, any of them, was, was Bill Clinton at Charlotte. I mean, he made a better case for Barack Obama than Barack Obama's ever made for Barack Obama. Uh, so, I mean, he's a gifted, talented guy. I mean, we're talking about the problem with white working class and, and Democrats. I mean, Bill Clinton uh, carried Catholics by 20 points. He carried... Uh, he, he lost. He lost college, edu high school educated uh, voters by only two points. I mean, he he had a way of connecting uh, to, uh, to. But he also is one of the great, legitimately great policy wonk yeah. guys around. I, yep. I, I I would hope he'd just be involved. Yeah. Just seriously, and let's let's minimize one thing. There's some supposition that because he was president, he would have a weirdly different role in the White House than the other first spouses. But in every White House I've ever covered, the first spouse has a role that is awesomely powerful and completely opaque. And the first spouse is the one who's feared more than the president. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In every case, the first spouse is much tougher than the president when it comes to firing people, punishing people. Uh, in this case, that wouldn't be the case. <laughs> Hillary's tougher. Yeah, that, that's exactly <laughs> right. But, uh, but, uh, but, but I hope he would just be in there and but have an influential role, but make it an open role. Uh, and not an opaque role the way the current first spouses have all had. No, I don't, there may be uh, somebody in American public life who combined you know, street smarts and emotional political IQ points more than he, I don't know, I don't know who it was. I've never, I've never seen a guy, I, and he didn't like me much for a couple of things I wrote, we had minimal contact, but just in watching, in watching him, uh, you know, except for that one small flaw uh, and I don't mean just to kind of the more liberal, I mean that there is this, this something missing in the guy's character that had it been present would have made him, I think, a president for the ages. I really do. But of course that's like, you know, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Yeah. Well, uh, people run for office because they're driven by some hunger. Mm -hmm. There's a rosebud in and all And nobody though. driven more than he. Yeah, yeah. And so they all have that, that problem, yeah, I which, guess both, right. which makes, because normal people don't run for president. Right. <laughs> so this is a good place to, uh, to end. It's a question I like to ask whether somebody has prompted me or not, but in this case they have. So the question is basically, it's broad, and I'll, the question is about optimism versus pessimism. Let me frame it. Let's say that we show up here we're all mobile, ambulatory, in possession of our faculties 10 years from now. Uh, will we be in a better place? Uh, I'm talking about the, the, the country. Will the country be in a better place than it is now, or a worse place, or is that simply beyond anybody's? I'm asking you where the, where the, where the vectors are going. Yeah. Uh, name a year you'd want to go back to. Uh, in race relations, I mean, we have a lot of problems in race relations. Is there a year in the past you'd want to go back to? Uh, in social re relationships, and tolerance for different sorts of people and their orientations? Uh, I happen to think we are, if, take, just like take, you know, all, all of us or many of us lived in this city in the 1970s. Would we want to go back to that? Uh, if you take the, the social indicators that went south in the 60s and stayed terrible through the 70s, they're all now moving in the right direction. Crime is down 70%. Teenage violence is down 50%. Domestic abuse is down 50%. Uh, teenagers are having fewer sexual partners and they're starting later. The abortion rate is down by a third. The teen pregnancy rate is down by a huge percentage. Uh, all these social, this young generation is a very wholesome and responsible generation um, because we were such awesome parents. Uh, but, uh, but, so we're in a period of great social repair. For the first time, maybe in decades, I think nine out of the 10 most valued companies are American companies. The tech world, we're still tremendously creative. 
Um, we're, in, we're still the country that, inhabit, that uh, inherits a lot of talent and draws a lot of talent from around the world. And so we've got a little political problem, <laughs> which is that our politics doesn't work. And so that's a concern. But name a country you think is more better poised. I mean, politicians say this all the time, but it's true. Better poised for the next 100 years. I really do not think there is one. And so the two things I worry about is the income stagnation and the, the, the persistence of poverty. And I worry about the next 10 years in the Middle East mm. and the next 30 years in the Middle East, which I think it's going to get much, much worse. Uh, but, um, but as far as the health of this country, you know, you go back and look at all the books about the decline of America, they're always all wrong. And I'm st I started with a basic faith in the trends of history, and I'm ending with that. Oh. I, I, would, I would say this. <laughs> yep. That um, you, you couldn't hear what David said and then listen to the Republican debate and, and think you were on the same planet. I mean, they're, they're convinced the country is in a, it's already there, it's in a handbasket, hell is just right around the corner, and that we're running by ethical eunuchs and moral lepers who are, you know, stealing from us and, and, and indifferent. I, I, would, I would say uh, what's missing from our public dialogue, and, and David and I have talked about this, is um, the question that is too often asked by our campaigns, starting really by President Reagan in 1980, but emulated by all his would-be successes since, are you better off than you were four years ago? And the question instead should always be, are we better off? I mean, are the strong among us more just, or the weak among us more secure? And it, it, hit, it hit me um, as we were about to go to war in Iraq, and the Congress was voting on it. And my assistant and I talked to 535 congressional offices, and we asked only one question. Does the Congress, member of Congress or the Senator, have a child in the enlisted ranks of the United States military? Out of 535, there was one. Senator Tim Johnson, Democrat of South Dakota, the son Brooks was in the 101st Airborne as a sergeant. Now, why do you say enlisted ranks? Because that's, those are the people who die. Admirals don't die. Generals don't die. Colonels don't die. Sergeants die. Lance Corporals die. PFCs die. And if, if a country is not willing uh, to, and I say this as a chauvinistic Irish American, I stand in awe of the British royal family, that they serve, that Harry serves, and Prince William serves, and, uh, and they have not avoided combat. And it, it is, not, not consistent with the American values. Uh, we are about to have a, another presidential election where not simply Mrs. Clinton, but none of them has served in the, in the military. Um, and believe me, it's just a hell of a lot easier to talk tough when it isn't your son or your daughter uh, who's in harm's way. Um, and <laughs> so, I, I, grew up in, I grew up in, as Jeff mentioned, in Massachusetts, and uh, two Republican senators during World War II. Henry Cabot Lodge was the first United States senator since the Civil War to resign from the Senate to enter the military and became a tank commander fighting Hitler's armies in North Africa. Leverett Saltonstall, the other Republican senator's 19-year-old son Peter, left Yale to join the Marines and was killed in the Pacific. And Franklin Roosevelt's four sons all served in combat. Uh, and this is, this is the question, are we in it? And uh, instead of the, the genuflecting on one side of economic individualism and cultural individualism on the other side, I, I, I would, that would be the test. Um, and David talked about national service. I, I believe devoutly that every American at the age of 18 can give two years to his or her country. Uh, there's so much to be done beyond the military to make ours a, a better, fairer, more humane country. And I think that will be the test. Will it come up in this election? Will it come up in this debate? I, I only hope. Mm -hmm.
when we come back in 10 years, I expect all of you to be here. <laughs> and it was a privilege, even temporarily, to join, to become the third wheel, if I may, <laughs> on Shields and Brooks. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>